we're going to go ahead and start. Michaela's going to walk in any minute. Debbie okay, Daniels Debbie. just arrived, so. <coughs> yeah. We're going to... We're going to get started. Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Hall, president of the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing on midlife and older women's health. The Women's Congressional Policy Institute, or WCPI, as many of you know, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy organization whose mission is to bring women policymakers together across party lines to advance issues of importance to women and their families. We work closely with the members and staff of the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. I would like to first thank our briefing co-sponsors, Congresswoman Susan Brooks and Lois Frankel, co-chairs of the Women's Caucus, and Congresswoman Mimi Walters and Brenda Lawrence, vice chairs of the Women's Caucus. Our thanks to Amgen and Therapeutics MD for underwriting this briefing. Both companies are committed to the health of midlife and older women, and both have been strong supporters of our organization over many years. And I want to particularly acknowledge Rebecca Mandel, who's here from Amgen. And also, unfortunately, Julia Amadio, who was going to attend for Therapeutics MD, had to cancel her trip thanks to the hurricane. Uh, but we also thank her as well. We welcome our speakers, Dr. Nikayla Cook and Dr. Joanne Pinkerton, who will be introduced shortly. And also are pleased to welcome our Vice Chair, Board Vice Chair, Anna Schneider from Volkswagen. And I don't think Ambassador Connie Morella has arrived yet, but she will be here soon. This briefing is being videotaped and should be available for viewing early next week at our website, wcpinst.org. So please tell your colleagues, anyone that missed, um, they'll be able to see the videotape of the uh, event shortly. We also will be live tweeting during the briefing, and we encourage you and others to do so as well using the hashtag WCPI Health. I am now very pleased to introduce the Democratic co-chair of the Women's Caucus, Congresswoman Lois Frankel. She is serving her third term representing the 22nd District of Florida. It serves on Foreign Affairs and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. Congresswoman Frankel has been a strong advocate for women's health, veterans, seniors, and families. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, am I doing it from here? No, no, no don't, don't do that. We, okay. we have to do a dance. There we go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Ooh, this is a tall thing here. Welcome. Thank you, Cindy and Cheryl, for all the... Let's give them a hand for all the great work they do for the, for the Women's Policy Institute. And I'll thank our, our chair isn't here yet, but our vice chair, Volkswagen. All right, thank you, Vol Volkswagen, <laughs> for what you do. And of course, let's see, who else am I going to thank? Oh, our sponsors. One of the sponsors is actually my constituents, believe it or not. And that's their Therapeutics MD. And thank you to them and Amgen for what you do to make our lives, women's lives better. And of course, these fabulous people who are gonna, you're going to hear from in a moment and all of you for being here. So let me just start by saying, you know, life is a journey. Uh, and although we live in the same world, it's in so many ways, it's different for men and women. I'm glad to see a few of you men here. <laughs> and it's different socially, economically, and as we focus today uh, our, on our health, uh, and you're going to hear from Dr. Cook and Dr. Pinkerton, who are two, as I said, fabulous, renowned experts in this uh, area. Oh, there you are. <laughs> OK. Uh, I, I look at around this room. Yes, most of you are, are young. To me, you're young. <laughs> but you are young. And I want to say uh, that probably some of the things we, that are talked about today seems very far away. Hopefully, it is very far away from you. Um, but if you have a long, good life, you're going to get there. And there are some, there's some challenges with aging. There's even a musical called Menopause. It's called Menopause the Musical. Have you seen it? Menopause the Musical, which follows four women shopping for lingerie at Bloomingdale's. That's one of my favorite department stores. And I know Debbie loves it, too, right? And they... they they sing songs 
about chocolate cravings, hot flashes, lost memory, nocturnal sweats, and sexual predicaments. And the lyrics parody the popular music from the baby boomer era, that's my era, and, and includes numbers like staying awake and puff, my God, I'm dragging. <laughs> and I can tell that most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, listen, but don't let that scare you because with aging also comes liberation. I assure you of that. There's a lot of liberation, right, ladies? Uh, so, uh, but he, here's the, 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 the thing. Having knowledge is very important to know what to expect and what you can do and what tools will be available. And for you, most of you here, by the time you get my age, I'm sure... The, all you doctors and researchers are going to figure it all out. So you're not going to have any of these problems. Uh, I wish. <laughs> but it's going to make your journey happier and healthier. Thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Frankel. And we appreciate your constant presence and vigilance around these issues. And uh, there was a great hearing yesterday some of you may be aware of on sexual harassment that the Women's Caucus sponsored. Uh, Congresswoman Frankel presided. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell was there, too. Um, and we just are so uh, pleased with your leadership, and thank you so much. Our next speaker is Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who is in her second term representing the 12th District of Michigan. And she's a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the House Subcommittee within that committee. Congresswoman Dingell formerly served as founder and chair of the National Women's Health Resource Center and the Children's Inn at NIH. She has been a longtime champion for women's and children's issues, health issues particularly. Okay, Debbie. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. And it's great to be here with so many people. It's great to be here with these two wonderful experts. I've known Cindy Hall longer than we want to acknowledge that we've known each other. Uh, the auto Volkswagen, it's great to see my friend here. I supported this organization long before I came to Congress. And even before that, I am not old, but I am seasoned. <laughs> and I'm looking at this room. I'm really, I want... It, I started the National Women's Health Resource Center because I found out when I was in college that we, because we were women and we had hormones, we weren't being included in any federally funded research. My uh, college roommate had developed a heart problem and there was like zero information. So that's uh, uh, when Cindy said, would you come and say a few things? I am going to say, most of you, some of you, well, I'm not going to get into trouble. Many of you look young. Many of you, but I want you to tell you this. When I started this, nobody said the word breast. This was not that long ago. When I worked at General Motors, General Motors didn't cover mammograms. There was no research being done on breast cancer. So I met Nancy uh, Brinker, and I went on the Coleman Foundation, and I went on Susan Love, and I became engaged in breast cancer. But then, because I work with a lot of people and I listen, I started hearing about heart disease, and that heart disease was a bigger danger to us as women. And yet, to this day, to this day, the largest study that has been done on, car, on heart, heart disease is the Framingham Heart Study. The aspirin a day keeps the doctor away. You've all heard that. There were no women in that study, none, none. And that's still, so I started to become, you know, and as I've dug in, I found out, you know, every, we all get this information and you gotta watch your cholesterol. But in a woman, a C-reactive protein may be a bigger indication of potential heart disease. How many of you have ever heard of C-reactive protein? And then I, Bernadette Healy came to NIH, by the way, you should, am I right? You're gonna tell, I mean, C-reactive protein can be an indicator, can be a marker for heart disease in women. No one talks about it. Uh, Lois is now ready. I don't normally give her this. I, I'm here because I'm talking to you about. Then we got finally began to make some progress. The NIH, I was on the first panel uh, that studied women's health care. 
at NIH, and that study, by the way, found that estrogen could be harmful to women, so this panic cry went out and women stopped taking estrogen. And yet I'm going to tell you, yesterday I'm not going to give you the name of the other member, because I wouldn't want to embarrass her, or I wouldn't, it's private, but she had just come from the doctor. And she, we were of similar age, or maybe a couple of years older, and uh, she, we both had hysterectomies in our 40s. I have never taken estrogen. I did not take hormones because I had had that study and didn't know. And she told me, I am an informed person. I, st I read, I study. And she said, oh no, don't you know we're supposed to be taking estrogen, it's a danger? That's the problem. We are for informed, educated people. And women don't know what's the right policy. We haven't invested in it. We need far more money to be put into it. And if people like us are getting conflicting information, you know, how many times you know, we get different information on how often you should be screamed, how often should you have mammograms, how often. We need to put women front and center of the research health agenda in this country. I thank you for being here. That's what we got to work for. Right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Dingell. You know why we invited her to speak. <laughs> Um, and we definitely appreciate your call to action and all of your many oh, years terrible. of work on these issues. It matters. Um, Turn that off. And it, without further ado, we're going to hear about these issues. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Nikayla Cook, Chief of Staff in the immediate office of the Director, IOD, of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, part of the National Institutes of Health, NIH. Acronyms just like on the Hill, right? <laughs> Dr. Cook provides institutional leadership to support the NHLBI director, serves as his liaison to senior officials within and outside of the institute, and provides oversight to the support operations of the IOD. Additionally, she provides institutional leadership to catalyze multidisciplinary activities initiated by the director. As such, she provides leadership for the strategic direction of the Women's Health Research Agenda and at, excuse me, at NHLBI and serves as a spokesperson related to the health of women for the Institute. Dr. Cook. Good afternoon, and thank you so much. It's such a privilege and an honor to speak in this important session, understanding the health of women across their lifespan, and particularly in mid and later life. And I'd like to commend the Women's Congressional Policy Institute and the representatives, Lois Frankel, and as well as Debbie Dingle, for being here today to really inspire us on this topic. I'm going to give you a particular perspective from the NHLBI and focus a bit on the cardiovascular health of women, which we just heard is so important for us to think about now and into our um, future. So today, I'll share some trends with you about life expectancy and leading causes of death for women, as well as explore some of the sex differences that actually exist in the burden of cardiovascular disease, um, and specifically talk about hypertension as a key driver of cardiovascular disease in women. And I want to introduce to you a broader concept about the heart-brain connection, and we'll examine some of the shared risk factors for cardiovascular disease that also actually affect later in life implications for dementia and neurocognitive function. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about opportunities for the future um, that have the potential to really set a stage for a research agenda that can be transformative for the integrative health of women across their lifespan. So let's start with life expectancy. It's increased over the decades, um, although there are differences, as you can see in this curve on the left between by race and sex. And on average, women actually live longer than men, and we represent a large proportion of the older U.S. population and thus experience health issues of older age. And that can include heart disease, but it also can include things such as um, cardiovascular disorders that may have a more particular prevalence in women, like hypertension, heart failure, and stroke. And if we live longer, we're also at risk for cognitive impairment and dementia. And so the fact that we have a longer lifespan, but actually comprise a greater proportion of the older people living in the US, it's important for us to take heed of the potential implications this may have for health. 
So as I mentioned earlier, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States for women. And in fact, if we look at this um, in the kind of a more practical number, one of every four female deaths in the United States is due to heart disease. And heart disease is one component of cardiovascular disease. And if we look at cardiovascular disease by age, we actually see that cardiovascular disease increases in prevalence as we get older. And if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see that the red bars represent women and the blue bars represent men. And as we get older and older, especially in the 80 plus years, cardiovascular disease prevalence exceeds that of men. And we also know that more American women each year die from cardiovascular disease than all cancers combined, really emphasizing the importance of the focus on heart disease. There are key differences between men and women in cardiovascular disease that are important to understand how biology and the changes in biology between the sexes are manifest. And here are a couple of salient examples. If we look at the absolute numbers of individuals living with and dying from cardiovascular disease, this is higher in the US for women as compared to men. There are differences in the epidemiology, and the clinical presentation actually can also differ between men and when, women. We know that women can experience symptoms that may seem different than what we would expect to see in, women, in men when they present with a heart attack. There are also differences in clinical outcomes. We know that outcomes amongst women haven't improved at the same rate as men when we look at cardiovascular disease. And disparities exist in the application of evidence-based therapies. When we know something works, it's less likely that women will receive those therapies, those evidence-based therapies, when they present for a heart attack as compared to men. We are also recognizing the scientific importance of sex as a biological variable meaning that there are sex-specific influences on the physiology of the body and when that goes awry, the pathophysiology, and it influences outcomes for women. So just a few more twin trends that I wanted to display. The differences that I talked about in the pathophysiology actually are seen in the differences of burden of disease by sex. And I mentioned that cardiovascular disease is a broad umbrella term. It actually encompasses coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, and hypertension. And if we look at deaths in cardiovascular disease, actually we know that there's been a steep decline in the deaths from cardiovascular disease over time, as shown by the graph on the left. But it's important to look at the difference between the red and the blue in terms of men and women. We had a peak in cardiovascular disease difference, cardiovascular disease death differences in about 2000, with women dying at more higher rates as compared to men. And slowly, with further education about the risk of heart disease in women, with studies that are starting to decrease the gap in the therapies that are applied for women when they present with heart disease, we've seen that gap actually narrow. And eventually, we've reached equilibrium in about 2013 or 2014, which I think is a huge win for us in the United States. But if you also look at this trend, you'll notice that the decline isn't as steep now in the later years between 2014 and 2015 as it was previously. So we still have work to do. And we know there's a burden of risk factors in women that are still causing that line not to continue to decline in the way that we would have anticipated. When we focus on the subcomponents of cardiovascular disease, and specifically let's look at the unique challenges of myocardial infarction or coronary heart disease in women, we understand that this is actually a unique entity in women. There can be differences, not only at the time of presentation, women tend to present at an older age with acute myocardial infarction as compared to men, but they also present with other coexisting conditions and comorbidities because of the age at which they're presenting. And we know that women have more complications from a heart attack as compared to men. Body size as well as dosage of medications actually matter in women, and we've started to see correlations between those and complications that can occur after myocardial infarction. The American Heart Association, in recognizing the, the real difference between men and women in myocardial infarction, actually convened a group to produce the scientific statement on myocardial infarction in women and really highlighted some critical influences of 
outcomes in myocardial infarction in women. And they raise the issues of epidemiology that we've been talking about, the differences in prevalence and mortality and age. But there were also some other very specific things that were important in this report. Women actually with myocardial infarction are more likely to die 12 months after NMI as compared to men. And younger women are particularly at increased risk if they present with a myocardial infarction, with mortality rates that are higher than older women and higher than men of similar age counterpart. We know that the pathophysiology, meaning what actually caused the myocardial infarction in women can differ. And particularly, we see differences in things like whether a plaque in an artery is rupturing versus whether it's eroded. In women, we tend to see more erosion than we see rupture. We also see things like the actual artery splitting or causing what we call a coronary artery dissection more frequently in women as compared to men. So the underlying cause of the heart attack in women can be different as compared to men. We talked about the fact that symptom presentation can differ, but also risk factors differ, and the potency of risk factors differ. So if a woman has diabetes, she has a four to five-fold increased risk of having a heart attack as compared to a man with diabetes whose risk factor increase may not be as steep. We also have talked about the fact that recommendations for medical therapy after a heart attack are similar for men and women, though it's likely that a woman may receive less of that evidence-based therapy when, they, when she presents with her heart attack. So let's look at another component of cardiovascular disease and talk about these sex differences. And in this case, um, I would talk about stroke, and that we see stroke mortality, prevalence, and even um, hospitalizations are higher in women as compared to men. And each year, we know that about 55,000 more females have stroke um, than men. And that females have a higher lifetime risk, meaning that if you start to look at a woman at a younger age and project out over time the risk of having a stroke, the risk is one in five for females as compared to one in six for males at the age of 55 to 75 years of age. And in the oldest groups, we know that the age-specific incidence of stroke is higher in females as compared to males. So stroke itself is actually um, one of the reasons that we're going to talk more specifically about hypertension and high blood pressure, because it's so important to understand the risk that it can convey for women. And the last component of um, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, that I wanted to give you a, a peek into in terms of the um, epidemiology and statistics for women is to show you that heart failure mortality and hospitalizations actually ex in women exceed men. And heart failure is really um, a, a, a difficult component of cardiovascular disease to talk about because it disproportionately affects adults, older adults. 80% of cases occur in individuals that are over 65 years of age. And if you look at the U.S. population, we know that those over 65 years of age are going to double by 2050. And that's going to be with women outnumbering men. And this is actually a true complication of, of hypertension that actually is really important for women. 40 to 70 percent of first known cases of heart failure occur as what we call this heart failure where your pumping function of your heart is preserved. And this is very common, much more common in women than it is in men. And we don't understand what this really is about and why this is the case. And there's a lot of research that we need to do in order to disentangle that for women. So I alluded to the fact that hypertension is this last component of cardiovascular disease that's such a potent risk factor for the other components. And hypertension itself um, really occurs across a woman's life course. And so um, we talked about the different age range of, of individuals that are here today. And hypertension is one of those things that you have to look at at every single age range. It occurs more frequently in women as compared to men. And after 60 years of age, the prevalence is higher in women as compared to men, and the gap continues to widen related to the increasing proportion of women in the older population. But if you look across the lifespan, looking at the image on the right, even um, hypertension is showing up in teenage years, young adult age years, um, more frequently than what we had seen in the past, likely related to the incidence of overweight and obesity in our population. But even in pregnancy, the complication of hypertension actually can pretend adverse cardiovascular outcomes much later in life, and we're starting to understand that relationship. Hypertension also shows up after menopause related to the fact that the estrogen protective effects that we have on our vasculature are no longer there, and thus the vessels become stiffer and actually cause us to have 
higher increased risk for things such as stroke and heart failure. The other thing that's really interesting about hypertension in women is that women are more likely to develop the long-term complications of hypertension than men, including the stiffness of the heart muscle, the stiffness of the arteries, and dysfunction in the relaxation of the heart muscle itself. The other thing that I wanted to mention about hypertension is this risk it has for the development of heart failure. And you may remember that we talked about heart failure increasing in proportion in older women. And heart failure itself um, has, we've studied it quite a bit, and this entity of heart failure that I talked about with the preserved function or pumping function of the heart in older women um, has been studied in the Women's Health Initiative. It's a study that's been sponsored by the NHLBI in order to really understand sex-specific factors that affect cardiovascular health as well as other um, aspects of um, health for women. And when we look at this analysis within the Women's Health Initiative, we actually see that hypertension in the black bars on the right, as compared to other risk factors which are, which are shown in the other bars, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, hypertension is the most potent driver of heart failure in women. You see the bar much higher in black as compared to the others, and it's across all races and ethnicities. The one thing I would point out, though, is that if you look at African Americans and Hispanics in the last two groupings of the bars on these charts, um, the proportion of increase in heart failure and potency of hypertension is more pronounced in those populations. So very important um, that we focus in on hypertension and what we can do to improve long-term life expectancy. So within the Women's Health Initiative, Further work has been examined to try to understand heart failure and its risk factors. And one of the things that we've been doing in the Women's Health Initiative is not just observing what's happening in women, but also trying to intervene. And there have been trials, um, intervention trials within the Women's Health Initiative that are looking at things like physical activity and what effect it can have on heart failure later in life for women. And this study just published actually showed us that if you randomize women to have different levels of physical activity, those that have the higher level of physical activity and walking itself actually reduce the risk of developing heart failure in later life. So at midlife, taking this type of physical activity work into action actually reduces the long-term outcome of heart failure in women. And this is actually really important given we know this challenge in treating heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in women. And if physical activity is something that can hold hope for prevention, that's something we all can do. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and make a connection between the risk factors we've talked about for heart disease and actually how they relate to the fact that um, women actually have increased implications for cognitive impairment and dementia. We talked about all these risk factors, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and smoking, and how they can have different potency of effect in cardiovascular disease. Well, these are the same risk factors you can see for cognitive decline as well as dementia. And in fact, we know that as women age, they have more challenges with cognition and independent living. Um, if you look at the graph on the left, um, that really relates to cognition in terms of difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions, you'll see in the oldest age group, women actually have more challenges with this as compared to men. And staggering differences if you look at the difficulty in doing daily errands, um, and particularly, again, women in the older age, or gr age groups having more challenges with this as compared to men. So what are we doing at NHLBI to understand this? Well, we talked about hypertension as a key driver of cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, and dementia. Well, we actually studied in a study called SPRINT, um, a systolic blood pressure intervention study, whether or not we lowered blood pressure beyond standard rates of lowering. So if you lower it down to a systolic of 120 as compared to about um, 140, which is the standard therapy, we actually see reduction in complications of high blood pressure as well as reduction in the rates of death. And so we've also partnered with our colleagues across NIH to understand what that means for cognition. And recently reported in an abstract form at a scientific conference is that the intensive management of blood pressure as compared to the standard management also reduced the rate of mild cognitive impairment in individuals as well as the rate of mild cognitive impairment and dementia combined. And when you look at the MRIs, um, the brain scans of individuals who were in these studies, you actually saw smaller increases in what we call white matter lesions, which are associated with 
dementia and cognitive decline on MRI. We also recognize that vascular dementia and Alzheimer disease share underlying disease mechanisms. And so one of the things we've looked at are the genes that may be related to this. And the APOE gene is known to increase the risk of both Alzheimer's disease and atherosclerosis. And you can see in the picture in the, member, in the mem middle, um, a PET scan that actually looks at um, individuals with norm normal memory, individuals that have an APOE4 mutation, and you can see the differences in the amount of red versus green there, and an individual with dementia with even more striking green there, um, showing the um, actual atrophy of some of the neurons. And on the right, when we actually start to look at the effect of APOE, if we look at women in the red graph and um, men in the blue graph, we see that actually the decline that you um, see in cognition over t or the number of people with dementia, um, it's actually stronger effect the APOE gene on the risk of dementia for women as compared to men. So even the genetic underlying factors can be more potent in women as compared to men. And I want to conclude by just talking a little bit about advancing the health of women in midlife and beyond by uh, a research agenda that's going to leverage the legacy that we have at NHLBI and doing research on women, but also sees opportunities to do things differently in the future, given where we are with our research technologies. We have um, initiatives and programs that have been longstanding at NHLBI to focus on um, women and heart disease in women. Some of these include uh, pregnancy studies where we're actually understanding the risk of hypertension and that association with long-term adverse outcomes of um, cardiovascular disease. The WISE study, or the Women's Ischemia Study, actually studied um, the pathophysiology of what's happening in a heart attack in women um, when they're presenting with symptoms of ischemia, and established the fact that women can have this entity called microvascular disease, which may not show up in the cath lab or when we're actually looking in the arteries, but it does show up in terms of adverse events that occur later in life and is an important entity for us to follow. We've had campaigns that are really focused on raising awareness of heart disease in women, and they've done a remarkable job, as you've seen, in the decline in the um, cardiovascular mortality for women. And the Women's Health Initiative has been one of the mainstays of the NHLBI's Women's Health Portfolio. And in addition to seminal findings years ago that reported that routine hormone replacement therapy was not protective for cardiovascular events, it has continued to yield really important findings for women. We've learned about physical activity and the risk of physical activity and being sedentary um, on cardiovascular disease and health. But we've also learned that if these interventions of light intensity and moderate activity are actually given to women, that it can improve their outcomes. We're studying heart failure in the Women's Health Initiative and really um, randomizing women to physical activity interventions and strength training and understanding how that affects elderly women. We're looking at cognition in the Women's Health Initiative. And the, the WIM study actually told us that cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes are associated with cognitive incline, decline in women. But then we've now found that there may be other ways in which we can start to address that through interventions. And the Women's Health Initiative is looking forward to a future that's focused on precision medicine, healthy aging, and cardiovascular health, as well as resilience. At NIH, many of us um, focus in on strategic planning in order to address research priorities. And at the NHLBI, we've identified priorities that relate to normal biology all the way through workforce and training. And what's important to note about this is that women's health spans every objective of our NHLBI strategic plan. And there are ideas of how we want to advance the goals related to improving the cardiovascular health of women as well as the lung and sleep health of women embedded within every objective of that plan. And one of the things that we see for the future is that if we begin to recognize sex as the highest order of precision medicine, that we actually have the opportunity to understand how those clinical risk factors interact with exposures, and as well as the genetic susceptibility and lifestyle and physical activity and social determinants of health to figure out those pathways that we may be able to do something about earlier in order to improve the health of women. And this is just one example that talks about some of the things that we've learned if you use a precision health story um, in order to dissect findings. And this study was actually um, in 
trying to tease apart whether or not hormone therapy actually could be beneficial in women if given in a shorter span after menopause as compared to later following menopause. And what we find is that there actually are effects of estradiol on the progression of atherosclerosis that differs according to when you start hormone therapy. So it basically tells us that it's not about um, lumping everything together, but actually understanding how we disentangle, which is a real source of precision medicine to understand therapies in the future. I'm just going to skip over towards the end to say that if we address the challenges of cardiovascular health in women and we leverage these opportunities and characterization and phenotyping or understanding um, the clinical features that may present as well as genomics and data science, we can have a transformative impact on the health of women. We have to recognize that sex is the highest order of precision medicine and that in understanding that, that we have the opportunity to think about prevention, diagnosis, and treatment different differently, and that we have the opportunity to find new targets of intervention that actually can improve the public health of women over their lifespan. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate any questions you may have after. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for such an excellent overview of sex and gender influences on cardiovascular health. And I um, think I speak for everyone in the room that there is just so much to learn. It's a little overwhelming, um, but it's so inspiring to hear all the good work that's being done. So thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you. Um, before introducing our next speaker, I wanted to acknowledge that Ambassador and former Congresswoman Connie Morella joined us uh, <laughs> just as you were starting to speak. She is one of our founder, founders and a current board member and also is a former co-chair of the Women's Caucus and an incredible leader in women's health during her tenure in Congress. An example of the older woman. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to, um, unfortunately, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, vice chair of the Women's Caucus, was here, and they called a series of votes, and so she didn't get the opportunity to speak. But we also acknowledge her incredible leadership of the Women's Caucus as vice chair and also her commitment to women's health, and so hopefully next time uh, we'll get to hear from her. So our next speaker is Dr. Joanne Pinkerton, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Division Director of Midlife Health Center at the University of Virginia Health System in Charlottesville, Virginia. She is past president of the North American Menopause Society, NAMS, and currently serves as, as its executive director. She is a NAMS certified menopause practitioner a longtime fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and past president of the South Atlantic Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Additionally, Dr. Pinkerton is editor for NAM's journal, Menopause, and section director for Menopause for the Journal of Women's Health. Her research and clinical care focuses on treatment of hot flashes with hormone and non-hormone therapies. Dr. Pinkerton. Well, thank you very much for this um, opportunity to speak and to everyone who's here. And we will get to my passion of menopause towards the end, but um, Cindy did ask me to cover some of the major health issues for women. And so um, with that, um, we're gonna go through a few things. The first is to recognize that although our population is aging and the number of women 65 and older is aging, also, the number of women 80 and over is aging. And it turns out that if you're a healthy woman at 80, on average, you live 14 years. And at least in my clinic, I've got a lot of older women in their late 90s, early 100s, still coming in to get their female parts checked. So I think that we've got a lot to learn about how to age gracefully and healthily. And I wanted to mention, we talked a lot about sex, and I wanna just bring up the racial issue because there's a lot of racial disparities in health, and we're finding them in OBGYN. So for example, there are more maternal deaths 
if you're African American um, and Hispanic, and more deaths from diabetes and hypertension. And also, there was just a study showing that in prematurity, there were more issues, um, health issues, among African American and Hispanics, and that Asian babies have more of the eye injuries than non-Asian babies. So there's a lot to learn about the racial issues also. And just, you know, Americans who don't graduate from high school have a two to three time higher death rate than those who, not death rate, but um, <laughs> it is a death rate. How could they all die at the same time? Anyway, let me say that differently. I took that statistic from somewhere. But the point is, if you don't graduate from high school, it's going to affect your health. Um, it delays in getting treatment, lower adherence to treatment, and less follow-up. And so our research needs to be sex and ethnically based also. I want to talk about just a few things that women might have heard about. You might have heard about you should get your hepatitis C tested if you're a baby boomer. And that's because we have found that that's the most rapidly growing group of hepatitis C carriers. And that's probably because the blood wasn't tested well um, until after about 1980 for hepatitis C and other infections. And also, we're having an increasing number of sexually transmitted infections. CDC has told us that there's more chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. But really importantly is that the rates for older adults jumped 20% between 2015 and 2016. And some of that's because people are finding communities to live in and people are having sex as they age. So it's something that we have to be aware of as a community. Um, in your handout are basic screening things, but I put a few controversies up there. How many of you know that there's now lung cancer screening? If you have a 30-pack year history of cigarette smoking, you can get a spiral CT scan every year and potentially pick up lung cancer earlier. Mammogram controversy. Who knows what age we should start our mammograms? 40? Or can we wait till 50? When should we stop our mammograms? They tell us 75. But the biggest incidence is between 60 and 70. So I'm finding breast cancer in women in their 80s and 90s, and we're just adjusting our treatment a little bit differently. So if you have an aging, healthy population, you need to adjust your screening to the patient. And the, USP, the United States Preventive Services says you need to take all of these screening guidelines and then individualize them for a given patient. Pap smears. Most of us grew up getting a pap smear every year, and now they tell you you don't need it. Is your doctor bad? No. We're now doing human papillomavirus testing, and it turns out that that HPV testing is more predictive of cervical cancer than your pap smear. So we can space it out to three to five years. So now they tell us we can stop it at 65, and you don't need them. But then a study comes out saying that 20% of women with cervical cancer are diagnosed over the age of 65, and they're not getting their pap smears. So yes, if you are negative on your pap smears all your life, you don't need one when you get to 65. But if you haven't been tested or if you've got the HPV virus, that risk continues and may change as your immune system changes. Osteoporosis. They tell us we don't need to test you until you're 65. That's when Medicare wants to cover it. But what if you have an eating disorder, or you've had gastric surgery, or your mother had a fractured hip? You might want to be tested at an earlier time. And for those of you who don't know, there's a new shingles vaccine. It is a, a recombinant DNA two-part vaccine, much better than the old one. So just a few little things to think about from screening. We learned a lot about the heart from Dr. Cook, but I wanted to reinforce what are the symptoms of a woman having a heart attack? Jaw pain might go down the arm. Shortness of breath, you might or might not have chest discomfort, pressure in the chest, nausea or vomiting, back pain or sweating. Not A lot of those symptoms wouldn't make you think, I need to go to the ER, I'm having a heart attack. And so if you have funny symptoms or someone you love has funny symptoms, get them to the emergency room. And if they're not found to have acute um, heart attack, they have different tests for women. We need a stress thal to, because our way our vessels um, clog is different than men. Diabetes is a huge issue. It's a huge racial issue, but it's a cost issue. One in three Medicare dollars is spent caring for people with diabetes, and women with diabetes have health care costs 2.3 times higher than if they didn't have the disease. And it's listed as the um, on the top 10 death for African Americans and Hispanics. It's not on the Caucasian group, so it's, uh, again, a racial issue that we need to look at. Breast cancer. 
Everybody fears breast cancer. Everybody knows about it. We have a lot of advocates about breast cancer, which is great. It's the most commonly diagnosed breast cancer, second leading cause of death. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Look around this room, that's approximately one at every table, versus for the men, it's one in a 1,000. Um, and there's a couple of new things. There is a new type of mammography called digital um, tomosynthesis or 3D mammograms. Instead of just doing the plain views, it takes uh, multiple views and allows a much better picture. I'm gonna show you one in a minute. And we also, you may have read that new finding that says that up to 70% of women don't need chemotherapy. And so, you know, if the biggest fear of breast cancer is that you don't want it to limit your life or threaten your life, but also you don't want to lose your hair. So if we can determine with precision medicine that you don't need the chemotherapy, there will be less morbidity. So that's really exciting. Um, when 3D mammogram came to my practice, I was thrilled because the pictures are so much clearer. And if you look on the right, on um, the first view is a 2D mammogram and you don't see anything. And then look at the next one where that circle is around. That's a 3D mammogram that picked up the breast cancer. In my own practice, the first year, I had eight more breast cancers than I usually find. The second year, comparison of two, the two 3Ds together, another four were found. And one patient had four breast cancers found. Um, and they didn't show on the 2D mammogram. For women who are at really high risk, you might hear about MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. We use that for people with the BRCA gene, so people like Angeli Jolie before she had her mastectomy. It is great at picking it up, but it has one problem. It overcalls. And so we alternate the mammograms and the MRIs to try to decrease those biopsies. And the 3D tomosynthesis also decreases the number of callbacks. So it's really um, not only are you finding more cancers, but you have fewer biopsies that are things that are for benign. Next slide, you're not going to be able to see what these different lines are. They're the different racial groups. But I want to make a couple points. On the slide on the left, it starts at age 20. And we're going to go all the way up until age 100. And you can see that women are being diagnosed at 20, 30, 40. So if we wait to start mammograms until 50, we are going to miss some women's breast cancers. You see the peak incidence, that big hump, is at between 60 and 70. But it keeps going on. If we stop doing mammograms at 75 in healthy women, we're going to miss some breast cancers that we could have treated. And then on the other side is the mortality, just showing you that there really are racial differences. Um, although more Caucasians are diagnosed, more African Americans die from their disease. And we think that's because of less access and less follow-up um, and something that we're working on. I'm going to move to another topic, bones. You know, people think about bones. I fell off my horse. I broke a bone. I was skateboarding. I broke a bone. Does that put you at risk? It might, because people who fracture might be because you're clumsy, and it might be because your bones are less dense. And one in two women over 50 will break a bone due to osteoporosis. And the incidence of hip fractures in the United States is increasing. It had been going down, and it stopped going down. Um, the risks early menopause, getting those ovaries out early, having a gastric bypass because you don't absorb your calcium, eating disorders, you never built good bone, steroids, lots of reasons. And you can see back fractures, very, very painful. That dowager's hump that none of us want to get, everybody sit up straight. Um, and just look at the difference in bone, the one on the left, nice, healthy bone, and then look on the right. And you can see you're missing the struts. And if you hit if you and I both go down the same ski slope and we hit the same tree, if you have osteoporosis, you're going to be more likely to walk away with a hip fracture than someone who has better bones. So what's the problem? We've got testing. It's DEXAS. Medicare covers it at 65. Or if you're on one of those anti-estrogens for breast cancer, it takes 15 minutes, low-dose radiation. Um, and we can test people who are younger. We just have to fight for it to say you have a risk. Your mother had a fractured hip. You're on steroids. You're a man on steroids. Lots of reasons to do the test. Treatment I'm not supposed to cover, but I wanted you to know that we have a lot of treatment options that are out there. Um, and about 30% of people who fracture a hip die in the next year. 
that's a really scary statistic. It's not necessarily because of the hip fracture. It might be the fragility that led to the hip fracture. But nonetheless, if your parent has a hip fracture, you have to think, oh my gosh, you know, it's not just about getting through the hip replacement and the hip surgery. It's the fact that they have a higher chance of dying. And right now, women are more afraid of the side effects of the medications than they are of the morbidity and mortality and loss of independence if they have a hip fracture. They've heard about osteonecrosis of the jaw. You have dental work, it doesn't heal. They've heard about stress hip fractures, and they occur, but they're rare, and hip fractures are much more common. So I just want to put the perspective out there that we have a lot of education to do with both our providers and our women. Um, I want to talk a little bit about depression. It's common. It's costly, and it happens across the life cycle. Postpartum depression can affect both the baby and the, the relationship. PMS, everybody knows premenstrual disorder. I get moody, I get irritable before my periods. But what if it affects your ability to work or your relationships? Then it's a disorder that needs treatment. And oral contraceptives can increase the risk for depression for some people having problems getting pregnant or with pregnancy loss, um, and also around menopause, perimenopause. We just came out with new guidelines about perimenopausal depression. And the elderly are at the greatest risk of suicide. And then I want to talk, we we're talking a lot about sexual harassment right now and the Me Too movement, but I want to give, show you two slides. Childhood adverse experiences affect you physically through your life. So two out of three out of all suicide attempts are related to having those. 60% of adult um, suicide attempts. And it is just really scary because women are three times as likely to attempt suicide over their lifespan. It's true that men are more successful. I'm sad for them, but I'm really sad that so many women are being driven to this. And the other part that's happening are these traumas experienced in adult that can also affect your health. And we are now looking at trauma-informed care, and Dr. Cook said they're looking at it in terms of heart and cognition. But you know, our female veterans, um, people who have seen civil unrest, people who lived in Charlottesville through the Alt-Me movement, um, terrorism, all of these things cause emotional distress that can then continue to be a problem in your health. And we um, now have communities where we're trying to help people feel safe to be able to start to talk about some of these things. Substance abuse, the opiate addiction. Did a study just came out, we read it in the car going up, that young women are now drinking more alcohol than men. That's bad because we don't handle alcohol very well and it increases our risk for many things, including breast cancer. And women who have and use drugs and alcohol is considered a drug may be having issues with their hormones, premenstrual syndrome, um, pregnancy issues, perimenopause, and they also have some unique reasons that they use these drugs to control weight because they're tired to cope with pain, or many, many times to self-treat mental health problems because they either don't have the time, the energy, or the access for care, or sometimes because they're taking care of too many other people instead of themselves. Dementia, Dr. Cook talked about it. You know, it could be Alzheimer's disease, it could be mini strokes, it could be Lewy body disorder, or just that one where all of a sudden you start giving your money away because you've lost your executive function. And the symptoms, of it, we all have them. A little forgetfulness, a little confusion, um, maybe wanting to live in the past, but it gets more severe. You're trying to come to see me and you end up in another city. Um, you are not able to balance your checkbook anymore. Um, behavioral changes, and just remember the bookshelf model. You know, we store our memories as they come in, so you lose those um, latest memories first, and then you lose your later memories. And that's why someone with dementia can often tell you everything that ever happened to them in their past, and they'll tell it to you extensively and repetitively, um, and then but not remember where they put the car keys or where they parked the car. Um, so now we're going to get to my favorite part, which is menopause. I didn't expect to become passionate about menopause, but I am. Um, typical woman in my practice, six to eight hot flushes a day, Mild, not so bad. Moderate with sweating. Severe stops what they're doing. Um, might have sweats a couple times a week. What does that lead to? They're not sleeping well. They feel tired. They feel irritable. They have brain fog. 
They don't concentrate as well. Julia can tell you when I don't sleep, I'm not as focused and as able to get through clinic. Um, but then also they can start to get vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, urinary symptoms, urinary incontinence, urinary urgency. Um, and there's a lot of jokes about it, but it's real. And the average age of menopause is 52, 45 to 55. But look what happens. Hot flushes start before. On average, they go seven years. But if you're African-American, they go 10 years. If you're Asian, they go five years. Um, so there are difference as those. And then you start to get the mood changes, the sleep issues. Then you start to get some of these urogenital changes in both the bladder and the vagina. Um, and then later on, we start to see cardiovascular disease because it's subclinical for a long time. And then the osteoporosis and then the cognition changes. So all of these are increased and changed in women. That's the sex difference part with the hormone part. Dr. Cook talked about the Women's Health Initiative, and she also talked about age matters. And I just wanted to show you the slide because it's, it's a very visual representation. If you start hormones and you are 50 to 59, so under 60, if you look on the slide in blue, there is less heart disease, no increase in stroke, a slight increase in blood clots because it was oral, a slight decrease in breast cancer because they put the estrogen-only arm where they found fewer cancers with the estrogen and progesterone arm where they found more cancers. So overall, it was net. And total mortality was decreased. And that's even been shown out 18 years out by Joanne Manson. But if you started when you were 70, started hormones in the WHI, more heart events, more strokes, more blood clots, and an increase in total mortality. So age really matters. There are some indications for hormone therapy. Many women never get the discussion. I hope that all of you, when you reach that point, will at least find a provider that will talk to you about whether or not it's a plus, we can give it to you safely if you need it. If you're having bothersome hot flushes or night sweats or if you're at risk for bone loss, um, and those are the two main reasons that we give it, bones and symptoms. But what about early menopause? If you, if you have a hysterectomy, you may go through an earlier menopause, but it's not acute. But what about if you get your ovaries out? Or if you have what's called genitourinary syndrome of menopause, it's a huge mouthful because it's the vagina and the bladder. And we worry about both parts as women age. The special populations, we now have really good studies showing that women who have early menopause, surgical or natural, have an increased risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, cognitive changes, Parkinson's, and glaucoma, and a paper that's going to come out very shortly is going to tell you they have an increased incidence of kidney disease. So we worry about those people, and it turns out that if you take hormones to the average age of menopause, your risks become the same as other people. So that was new information. What if you have persistent symptoms? What if you're the person who every time you try to go off hormones, your hot flashes come back, or you can't think as well, or you have bone loss and you can't take any of the other medications? We want to be able to talk to you about whether or not there's some ways to safely give it to you. Medicare says, based on the Beers criteria, nope. Nope, no one should get it over 65. And so we as advocates fight for women who have these persistent symptoms. So early and late are key issues for menopause specialists. And there's another group we really worry about. You know that there were 64 deaths from contaminated intrathecal steroids. It was a big issue on the Hill. And we got the Drug Safety Act. But what's going on for women? One out of three women, based on survey data, are using non-FDA-approved compounded hormones. They think they're safe, they think they're regulated, and they think they have no risks. And we're actually working with the FDA. I'm going to be meeting with them next month to talk about the fact that compounded hormone therapy has varying ranges. The estrogen levels in one study went from 69 to 269%. And the progesterone that protects your uterus was only 60%. So what happens if you get 269% of the estrogen and 60% of the progesterone and you have a uterus, uterine cancer, which we're now seeing, and we worry about breast cancer. Um, so this is a big issue that um, we want some help with down the road. Um, what do we agree about? We wrote a position statement. I had 23 national and international experts. I thought I was going to pull my hair out. But we did agree that if you're under 60, that the benefits outweigh the risk if you have symptoms or bone loss. And we did agree that you shouldn't start it 
if you're over 60 or 70, primarily. Now, some women are physiologically younger, and Dr. Cook could tell us how that is, but there are some women who will consider it. But if you come into me at 70 and you tell me I just started having hot flashes, I'm going to think about infection, TB, lymphoma. I'm not going to think about giving you hormone therapy. What doesn't get talked about? Painful sex, loss of desire, changes in your marriage, your relationship, your partnership. Vaginal atrophy is chronic, it's progressive, and it's common, and it's not talked about. Doctors don't ask about it, and women don't want to bring it up. And I'm just bringing it to your attention because it's common. And if your gynecologist does an exam, they can put a little piece of pH paper. And if it turns blue, you're lacking your vaginal pH, and you have vaginal atrophy. So it's an issue. Um, and the good news is that there are treatments, low-dose vaginal therapies that are available that are not systemic. Very little gets in your system. It's safe and effective, and we can even use it for breast cancer patients in limited amounts if we need to, if they're not on aromatase inhibitors. But again, if you don't talk about it, if you just stop having sex because it hurts, we can't help you. So it's a big issue for women that's not being talked about. And I want to close by saying I, am, I do wear two hats. I'm a professor. I teach residents and students. I take care of women every day who have these symptoms. But I'm also part of the North American Menopause Society, which is really a great source for you to get menopause information. We have a web page. You can go on it. We have certified practitioners who have studied and taken an exam, and you can find them by zip code. So if you walk in and say, you know, I'm having painful sex, and your doctor doesn't want to talk to you, Go put your zip code in and find somebody who's more knowledgeable about it. Um, it's up to you to take care of your health, um, and we just want to help you. And I really appreciate all the science because it helps us do evidence-based medicine for you. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinkerton. I think we gave her quite an um, <laughs> incredible <laughs> challenge. Talk about everything else. <laughs> And then um, talk about what I really want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you did an amazing job. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive overview. We have time for questions and discussion. Um, Cheryl has a microphone back there. Please give us your name and affiliation. And uh, I also do want to encourage Ambassador Morella, too, if she'd like to make any kind of comment. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy Hall. This is a fabulous uh, luncheon discussion. And Dr. Cook and Pinkerton, you were, you were incredible. I started taking notes, but there was just too much to... Uh, Uh-oh, it went too much too fast. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> On the contrary, I learned a great deal. Um, I, uh, I just feel also this, this situation of health is so important. I was at the genesis of the Office of Research on Women's Health, which has made all a big difference. Um, I remember I had the Medicare pay for osteoporosis, and that's when I found out I had osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know about it before then. And then working with Cindy on HIV and microbicides and women, so it's made a big difference. But what you've done needs to be needs to be spread. I learned a lot from listening to both of you, actually, and I thought I knew something about it. I am the, the older woman who, uh, just think about the vulnerabilities. We live longer. Uh, we have less financial stability in general, when you want to weigh it. And we have a heck of a lot more burdens. We have the burdens of taking care of, of family members uh, who, you know, who may need our help. And then we have information that we don't know. What you have said, and that's kind of what my question is, what can we do to get the word out with regard to what we should do, what can be done. We know that there are uh, male cells and female cells, but there are no Democratic cells or Republican cells. <laughs> so therefore, for the people here, they can probably help to spread the word too. But I just wondered if you have suggestions for action as a result of your wonderful speeches. Thank you. You want to go first? Sure. Um, Thank you for those comments. I think it's um, very um, exemplary of what we were discussing. It's a real challenge in terms of getting the word out. And we have um, 
at uh, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, worked through a campaign for many years um, to educate women about the fact that heart disease was their leading cause of death. And even after years and years of um, work that we thought um, was really putting the word out there, we still know that half of women don't know this and that that awareness lags even in certain populations. And so we've started to adapt approaches to start to think about um, special population focused approaches where um, we use uh, almost like a champion type model in terms of having others become the messenger of the message. And so I think that's actually something that we may have to think about even here, is that we can provide information, but we can only get it so far as our words or our reach can be. But then we hope that we can package that in a way that you can then be educated enough to talk to your colleagues, and so on and so on. And of course, we can provide that type of information to make women armed to be able to do that. Um, and we want to be a resource to do that for people and for societies, as well as what we found community-based organizations that do this quite well. I would, I would say that we're trying to get our societies to band together, and I see that, you know, Gay Johnson is here, so it's nurse practitioners and it's providers, all trying to get on a similar message. So we had a success. We, um, Medicare was refusing to cover some of the newer treatments for um, vaginal changes, the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, and the four societies wrote a letter, and in June, Medicare agreed that they, although they were already covering them for men, they were refusing them for women because they said pain was lifestyle. We said, nope, it's a medical condition of women. Four societies wrote, they agreed, and now women now have access to those. Um, we're doing the same thing with the uh, difficult to compound hormones. We're trying to get the word out that this is not safe. Um, and we again banded our societies together and we're gonna meet with the FDA. If that doesn't go well, I will be coming to you asking for letter <laughs> to help support us. Um, we are also trying to remove the boxed warning from vaginal estrogen. If you use low dose vaginal estrogen topically or even in the vagina, minimal systemic absorption occurs. It does not cause what was found in the WHI. It does not cause heart disease, stroke, um, blood clots, or probable dementia. And partners watch the ads and they say, I'm not gonna take something to have sex that's gonna give you dementia. And so we need to get that boxed warning adjusted so it's legitimate. If you use too much, you could get uterine cancer. If you have you know, breast cancer, you should be talking to your cancer specialist. But we're going to work on it from, since they turned down our petition from a scientific point of view, we're going to say, what's a normal postmenopausal estrogen level? And then we're going to do the science to show that it doesn't increase it. And then we're going to come back to you to say, now let's go to the FDA as a scientific information and try and get this done so it's more appropriate for women. So those are some of the things that we're working on. And the last one, which is the beers list for women over 65, I don't know how to get that changed, um, but first, when I find out, I will probably be needing letters from this group to help us support that. Okay, thank you. And Gay Johnson. Gay Hi. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Gay Johnson. I'm the CEO of the National Association of Nurse Practitioners of Women's Health. And I just wanted to let you all know that we actually have started a coalition, Healthy at Any Age Coalition. Some of you in the room have actually participated in that. And we're working on an older women's health agenda. So as we come together, all the organizations sharing our resources, that together we can be far more impactful and take care of the women that are so important to us. As they age, they're not gone. They're still vital. Connie Morella is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she actually was our keynote at our last meeting. So if you have um, questions about the Healthy at Any Age Coalition, you can email me at gjohnson at npwh.org, and I'm happy to share that information. Thank you. The other thing is there's an NIH pathway to prevention on osteoporosis coming up because this information about the increased risk of hip fractures and people being afraid to take therapy is a major issue, and so NIH has taken this on, and that's going to occur in October, and we can get information about that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I have a quick question about um, women in, in uh, research at NIH. Um, and Dr. Cook, could you tell us about um, the history of women in the Framingham Heart Study and why was the Women's Health Initiative started? 
It's, it's great history in that um, when the NIH was started, as, or the NHLBI was started, the National Heart Institute at the time, was about the same time that the Framingham Heart Study opened as one of the first studies that um, in a local city in Massachusetts actually tried to understand the association of risk factors and heart disease and really defined risk factors for heart disease that we talked about today. It was one of the first studies that um, we um, focused in on in terms of epidemiology and understanding risk factors that included um, women in order to understand both for men and women what those risk factors really were. Um, but it's that basis that actually became um, part of why the Women's Health Initiative was formed, because there was a recognition that um, those risk factors may have di different potency, as we talked about, as well as different effects on women, and that we needed to understand the hormonal influence on those risk factors for women specifically. And so it was out of that knowledge from the Framingham Heart Study on those risk factors for men and women that actually were then transformed into thinking about the sex-specific studies that needed to be done for women in order to understand the hormonal influences and how they may either preserve or actually, in some ways, um, not necessarily promote cardiovascular disease prevention in the way that it was thought to be. And I think it's a, a key point. The Women's Health Initiative told us one thing very clearly, mm -hmm. and that is that you shouldn't use hormone therapy to prevent heart disease. You need to do other things when you're looking at that. You know, and this um, information about Ambien, you know, if you're over 65 or 70, you don't, you get a lower dose of Ambien because we found out that women metabolize it differently and that you were having as much Ambien left in your system the next morning to make you an impaired driver. And, and when we talk about women in research, we can't can't forget about the racial issues. I just did a community symposium at an African American church and you know all excited about research opportunities and they said no, 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 you're just, you're trying to experiment on us. What about that syphilis study that you did, you know, on African Americans in prison? And so I think that as we move forward to take care of women, we have to think about age and our sex and also what are the ethnic differences and how are we gonna age gracefully? Because that's the goal, right? We wanna compress the bad parts of aging to the very last bit and be really active. We want to be you as we age. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Hi. I'd like to share with you, I started a nonprofit organization to help our veterans and their caregivers around the nation. My name is Constance Burns, and I'm, I started, I'm a co-founder, or really founder, of the National Association of American Veterans. We're based here in Washington, D.C., but I work with the caregivers around the nation, initially responsible for making the recommendations to the Dole Shalala team back in 2007, where I addressed the chairs, the two chairs, and the commission about the need for helping the military caregivers. And it became a bill in Congress, and it was passed by President Obama five years later. But about six months later, I completed the guide to um, healthy caregiving because there are a lot of female veterans that are caregivers for their loved ones returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. We've had a few that had massive heart attacks, and before they hit the floor, they were gone. And now we have, we're dealing with suicide among our caregivers and among our nation veterans around the nation, averaging now about 120 a day that's quote unquote being quoted. Wow. And you don't hear this in the news but it is a big problem now around the nation. So I'm doing a respite care retreat and I wanna share this information with my caregivers. And that's gonna be the 30th of November and the 1st of December. We're gonna talk about overcoming anxiety, managing stress, and doing physical exercises, just chair exercises to stretch. And that helps to eliminate stress and anxiety. And then we're gonna have spiritual wellness because that's important too. We're body, soul, and spirit, and that's what I shared with the secretary of VA. I serve on the suicide task force, and I said, what are we doing? We're body, soul, and spirit. That was utter silence. The next week, they had me briefing the two top veteran chaplains about what they needed to do and to be a part of the 
suicide hotline 24-7. Wow. So that's my goal, is to help my caregivers around the nation, prior wars around the nation. And uh, I will definitely put this information on my website. With your permission, I guess, the guest, with your permission, I would love to do that and to share this vital information. Thank you. Um, I do want to note that our next briefing is our annual veterans, women veterans briefing. It'll be on November 15th, and Constance is always there. And I, I would take this opportunity to also acknowledge uh, Dr. Irene Trowell Harris, who's the former director of the Center for Women Veterans at VA, who's with us today, too. Thank you. I just think that this whole issue of taking care of veterans, um, whether they are caregivers or whether they're the veterans that have the issues themselves, is huge and under recognized mm -hmm. and underdiagnosed and underhelped. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Pinkerton and Dr. Cook. Thank you so much for being here, and particularly Dr. Pinkerton for bringing up uh, the racial disparities um, uh, in, in women's health. Um, I ran a Google search while you're speaking because I was curious and I'm surprised to have found that um, the proportion of women who are mothers has increased, um, the number of children women have has increased as well, and I already knew that the average age that women are giving birth for the first time has gone up. I'm told that um, one hospital in Northwest DC that is particularly white and wealthy, the average age of a woman giving birth there is 39. Wow. Um, and I know that a lot of the discussion surrounding women's health has to do with, with childbirth and pregnancy, and those are very important factors, um, but I used to teach, and that for sure, at that point, I realized I'm not having children. And so uh, what, what does that mean for this group of women the, that is apparently shrinking that don't have birth? And, and that um, pertains to women that are LGBT as well that might be a parent, a non-birth parent. Um, so what does that mean for people like me who will never give birth, but also for this larger number of women who are giving birth giving birth to more children um, and giving birth later. You know, the, the um, issues, uh, you would need a whole briefing on some of these <laughs> obstetrical issues. Um, and I, I think the key, some of the um, health issues with women as they age are different because there's more preeclampsia, there's more blood pressure issues, there's more health issues. And then the other piece is how do they... How do they parent as they age? You know, if you are having children in your 40s or 50s, or even I think somebody's delivered a baby at 60, you know, what happens when you're trying to be that parent and caregiver for that person? There are health risks of being both um, transgender, LGBT, or not having children. And so I think it's important when you sit down with your provider to say, I haven't had children, how does that affect my risk? Um, early menopause, late menopause, not having children, having children late, all of those adjust your health risks, and I think that it's an important discussion to have. I don't know that it's being focused on. There is a lot of research about some of the health risks in the LBGPT group. I don't know that we have banding together for women who haven't had children, but it's also going to be who's going to take care of you as you age. Um, and, you know, you might be caregiving for other people, but then who's, what's going to happen for you? And that's another piece. I don't know if you want to comment on the health risks. Um, maybe a little less on the health risk, but I was really intrigued by your comment about um, health disparities. And is it okay if, yeah. if I um, jump to that for a moment? Because um, I think that you maybe raise an issue that we haven't emphasized enough. Um, in fact, we know that there are disparities in the care of women, as we talked about. Um, we know there are disparities by race and ethnicity as well. And one of the things that um, we've actually studied in our um, uh, really interested in is what we call this critical intersection of race, ethnicity, and sex. Because if you think about the fact that um, those uh, tendencies to have differences in care and poorer outcomes in certain scenarios actually compound when you look at certain race, sex groups, it's important to understand how people fare over their lifespan and where the opportunities are for intervention. So we understand that that's a very complex, multi-level, multifocal 
um, kind of approach that needs to be introduced. And we're thinking about that specifically in spaces like hypertension that I mentioned, where over half of the African American population is hypertension, or close to half. Um, and when you start to look at women that have hypertension with those um, risks of developing heart failure, as we talked about, or dementia, et cetera, you're going to see that compounded in groups such as African American women. And if you look at obesity, we know that um, overweight and obesity amongst African American women and Latino women um, are actually close to the 80% range when you combine those two categories. And that highest level of obesity actually carries such a potent risk for the development of hypertension and those other complications that it's really important to understand those intersections. So I applaud you for bringing it up because it's so important in cardiovascular health, um, but it's also an area that um, we have a an intense focus in trying to understand a bit more about the health of um, women of color. And, and also just, you know, not having children increases your risk of having breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Those are higher risks that happen. And so, um, and it's the same um, in the gay population, that those are higher risk. And also um, in the gay population, we have more alcohol abuse. And so, you know, some of that is going to come back to those childhood adverse events or things that happened as they went through that we're just trying to get our hands around. But the the whole issue for in obstetrics, which is this increased maternal mortality, you know, more pregnant women are dying if they're African American is something that we're trying to get our hands around because if we can figure out where it's coming from, we can figure out what to do about it. Okay. Um, I just have to say something. We have four of our fellows, class of 2018, our Congressional Fellowship Program. Anna Lee is one of them. Natalie Martinez, Jackie Wong, and Franny Einters. So I just wanted to do a shout out. Go ahead, thank you, it. Cindy. Um, and thank you so much. Oh, oh, geez. Um, thank you so much to both of our panelists. Those were really informative uh, presentations. Um, I was curious because uh, I know at least one of you potentially both brought up the demographic disparities for cancer screenings, specifically with um, Caucasian women generally getting screened much more often than African American or Hispanic. And then also, if you haven't graduated from high school, lack of education playing a part. Um, and this is, uh, I've heard this a few times in various briefings, and I'm curious to know if there's any sort of educational campaign taking place, um, either nationally or on a community, like local to local basis, um, or if you feel like that's more just sort of happening in the doctor's office. I, I can only speak as somebody who goes out into the community knowing that people are not getting screened. So um, when we do a health event, we, um, we're going to do one at the end of September. So the first hour and a half is health screenings. Um, and so we've had the mammogram van, vision and hearing. We do diabetes, te diabetes testing. Um, we give them free flu vaccines. We do mental health testing and also um, blood pressure testing. And then trying to get information out. Um, and it, it's a little different because you have to sort of get them. Sometimes they're around food and goodie bags. And then you can kind of have the talks. And one of the things we learned is they don't really want to sit and listen to talks. They want to ask their questions one on one. So this year uh, is a very different model. I have a number of people from um, different races and ethnicities coming. And we're going to do small groups targeted on cervical cancer and breast cancer and um, hypertension. And we have somebody coming in Spanish who will actually be able to, not only will the materials be in Spanish, but we're going to have, um, we're trying to get the headphones so that they can hear the talks and then have a cardiologist who speaks Spanish who's going to be able to answer questions. And again, instead of trying to do it in large groups, they're much more likely to do small groups. How did I learn that? We had somebody come talk about opiate addiction. It was great. I learned so much about it. Everybody was nodding their heads. She gets up and there's like a trail of people. And for the next hour, they were one-on-one -on -one asking the questions that pertain to them, what they were worried about in their family, you know, in their extended family. Because many people are taking care of their children, their grandchildren, um, and nieces and nephews. There's a lot of community that we're not getting to. And so I don't know of major programs. I just think that each community, hopefully, is trying to address it. I was just going to add that in the space of um, cardiovascular screening and advice, it's interesting that um, some studies have shown us it's really about um, people in the community hearing that from others that they trust. And um, there's a very interesting study about barbershops and um, high blood pressure that, um, you know, we've 
batted around the from barbershops to beauty shops idea um, in mm -hmm. terms of how we get information out. But um, I think that it's, it's, it's interesting that um, if you can, and this kind of goes to that train the trainer model that we were talking about before, um, actually engage um, community health um, information to people that are trusted in communities, that they're great conveyors of information in ways that actually now are demonstrating improvement and um, things that we can measure um, as it relates to health. So i um, happy to share that study with you if you haven't seen it. And, and trust is such a big issue because when we brought someone in who is African American to kind of talk about trust issues, um, and then we said, so how do you feel about trust in our community? And they said, oh no, we go, you do a test, you find something wrong, um, you give us medicine, we can't afford any of it, you give us bills, then you come back, you find more things wrong with us, you make more tests, you give us more medications. So instead of us thinking we're trying to help you find your health issues and help you figure out what's wrong, that lack of trust is affecting us. And so learning how to partner so that people can hear the messages from people they trust I think is really important. I think that's an excellent way to bring an end to our event. Um, and I know many more questions are probably out there. Um, I do want to thank each of our speakers for their excellent presentations. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again to the Women's Caucus leadership members and staff. I want to reiterate our appreciation to Amgen and Therapeutics MD for underwriting this briefing. And finally, last but not least, my thanks to Cheryl Williams, Shannon Wilson, and Julia O'Connor for helping to make this briefing possible. Thank you so much for joining us. And Cindy, we thank you. Let's give you a round of applause for making this happen. <laughs>